on Thursday. I'm gonna swim till Saturday. Breakfast with Bob. Oh, yeah. Pacho, man, bring it at home. We are Thursday edition Breakfast with Bob. My name is Bob Babbitt. We are brought to you by EAS Sports Nutrition, Hoka One One, Polar Oska Wellness, Velo Fix. We're doing our championship edition on Sunday at Four Seasons Hualalai, and we're airing on triathlonworld.com. My next guest, a true legend of the Ironman, six-time Ironman world champion, Ironman Hall of Famer, Mr. Dave Scott. How about a round of applause from our huge audience here today? <laughs> Big D. Thank you, Bob. That's quite an introduction. I mean, we first did this. You had like one or one sponsor, and Poncho wasn't as creative well, as he is now. Poncho didn't even. He had, he had one string on the ukulele. No, that he was had nothing, <laughs> right? He had one no, string, and we had a can with a little rope, and <laughs> pretended it was a microphone. Yeah, you always have a, a lavish spot here. This is gorgeous. Isn't I've never it? been here in you know 39 years. I've never been on this point. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, spectacular. Yeah. and quiet. It's it's very quiet, mm. and we love that. So so Big D, this is a 20 year anniversary of your really your last race here right mm -hmm. and what i love about that race and it's funny because when we were chatting on the phone i always look at the swim times i go you know 50 51 52 what's the difference all a couple minutes but you over the years you're always 50 50 50 50 52 50 21 you were always sub you know 50 and 51 minutes and in 96 you swam 53 which Ooh. i didn't think was a big deal but that changed the game <laughs> incredibly for you right being three minutes basically off of where you normally are well, I thought I uh, had the potential to go 50 or 51 in right. 96. I mean, quietly, Bob, we've talked about this. I thought, wow, you know, maybe, maybe I can win this race. And I just wanted to whisper that. I was 42 then. Yes. So you, you, you want to whisper it at that age. <laughs> That's uh, barely and, all you can do. Yeah, and I, and I knew I was behind <laughs> on the swim. Uh, ironically, I, I never wear a watch. I never really look at the time board. But I did see that as I exited. And I saw 53, and I thought, okay, okay, okay. I, I knew I was slow. I'll make it up on the bike. I'm strong on the bike, Exce extremely strong. It felt stronger than 94 when I was second, but that didn't happen either. So, um, and there were many, many times uh, in that 96 race where there's droves of guys going by me and yeah. they're they yelling encouragement. My legs just felt empty. And, uh, you know, I could have sang a song like Poncho, but uh, I didn't. And finally at about 85 miles, I said, you know, at least I have the opportunity to run. Right. But anyway, coming back to the swim, I was off on the swim that day. And so, but when you came off the bike, were you like 25th or something? I mean, a place you've never, a zip code you've never been in before. <laughs> well, it was a different zip code. I Actually, I thought I was about 50th because I, I thought, gee, there's another yeah. one. There's another one. I had lost count, and I certainly had lost uh, track of time. There was no way in heck whatever I ran, even if I ran 210, that I would have won that day. <laughs> but... Uh, I, I, I honestly, I didn't know what place I was uh, in until yeah. the next day. And someone said, oh, Dave, you were 26th, okay. not 25th. And so, you know, the outlook on the run, at that point, I was optimistic. I just sure. said, you know, I have a chance to do this marathon, run as fast as you can. And I just went crazy in the first uh, 10K coming through town here and passed a number of those guys that went by me on the bike. And I said, ah, oh, huh got a few of you yes but uh I, I certainly wasn't gloating by any means my intention at that time was to see if i could possibly get in the top 10 and that would be a, a great day well i think people thought that the fact that you were second in 94 and you came back in 96 at the age of 42 and you were you know 26th off the bike people are like okay dave's finally showing his age then all of a sudden we're watching you base go through that field during the run and when What's nice about that, at that point, you're sort of, hey, I've already won the race six times. I've already been second three times. Whatever I get at this point, obviously I want to win. I'm not going to win, but I can have a great run mm. and end the day on a great note. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that was my thinking, but you know, I, I obviously have a lot of pride. Of course you do. And uh, I just didn't want to throw it in. I felt like it on the bike and uh, had I you know, kind of felt sorry for myself. I'd see these forlorn looks of people that were my my allies and saying, "Come on, Dave, you can do it." And I think and they're saying, "Oh, geez, why don't you just call it a day?" <laughs> and uh, but when I got to the run, uh, my legs felt magical. Yeah. And uh, I thought, all right, I'm just going to go as far as I can. I ran out of real estate at the uh, at the very end of the race, but I was able to catch the top ten. A runner at about uh, 15 miles right. and, and I had said to several folks uh, my and my family that were out there I just said 
tell me where number 10 is. That's my game. And it's always been a game for me. So when I got to 15, 14, 13, finally to 10, I said, all right, I'm in, now I'm ninth. I'm ninth right now. That guy's not going to come back and catch no, me. right. So I kept thinking, all right, what, what can I do? But those guys are now running faster, eight, seven, six. Five were, were running quite a bit faster, right. and um, I caught the fifth place guy at about twenty three and a half miles. And I think Peter Reed was fourth that yes. year, but he was four minutes ahead and and not running well, <laughs> but well enough to maintain that slot. So I ended up fifth. So coming in fifth, running two forty five, I think, off the bike that day. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, after winning six times, you always want to win, but you know, you, you had this ability at this race to sort of change perceptions. Uh, change perceptions of Dave Scott's a great swim bike guy, but not a runner, right? Then you became a great runner. Uh, Dave Scott's 40 years old. What's he going to do at the age of 40? Nobody's ever mm -hmm. done that. He finishes second. Now you're 42. He's 26 off the bike. There's no way someone's going to run his way into the top 10. Then you finish fifth. Well, knowing at that point, I'm sure you're thinking, I'm coming back in 97. I'm going to have a better swim, so I'll be in a position, a better swim and bike. So I'll be in a position to be on the podium or potentially win this race. But looking back on it now, how satisfying was that to, to go out that way? Well, I think the 96 race, I mean, people always introduce me, as you do. Yes. Dave Scott, six-time Ironman champion, and that'll probably be on my gravehead. But, you know, you kind of look back at the, at the races that really are, are really ultimately more meaningful. To you, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, you sort of dig down deep and mentally dig down deep. And uh, coming back in 94, uh, obviously... Uh, uh, racing Greg and the rest of the field, and that was a real unknown after five years of our my battle with Mark here. Uh, and then in 96, uh, again, quietly thinking that I could possibly win that race, but I, I was buried on the bike and, and r really ready to, to say, you know, day's done, yes. but I was able to salvage a, you know, a, a really a great day for me, and mentally it was a great day. So fifth place, you know, I look at that, well, I've got six wins and three seconds and fifth well that doesn't sound very good but in the overall scheme of things uh, you know i'm quite happy with that one yeah so nowadays you're you're here in kona and uh you were always a guy on the cutting edge of nutrition you, you were always looking for the next edge right you were more than just a swim bike run guy you worked on core work before anybody else was doing it in nutrition talk a little bit about relationship with eas and what you're doing now because obviously nutrition is still something that you care a lot about and it's changed significantly mm. over the years yeah yeah, Bob, I think uh, I probably gave you bad advice uh, 30 years ago. And I'm still washing my cottage cheese, so <laughs> thank you for that. Well, I don't eat, I don't eat it, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. You can stop doing that now. Uh, oh, really? Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was 30 years okay, ago, right, uh, right. plus. Um, I was in Australia the last two years, and I had given a clinic there 25 years ago, and a, a couple of the old dogs came up to me, and they said, Hey, Dave... I've read about your nutritional slant now and, and good information that you're providing. 25 years ago, it was totally different. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but at the time, I, you know, in looking back, and, and, and I uh, follow the science, so I'm really keen on that sure. and, and making sure that I'm gleaning the best information, also looking at, well, what really works with the athletes and then trying to apply it. And, and everyone looked at uh, carbohydrate utilization. It was all about carbs. Yes. And it, Bob, in the 80s, it didn't matter what kind of carbs. You know, we found something on the sand down here. We'd eat it if it's a carbohydrate. But, and especially uh, two nights at the carbo party, right? Exactly. That, that was all in. It's how much yeah. pasta can you eat, even if you've never really trained on it yeah two days before the biggest race of the year you're in you're engorged with it well I, and a, lot, a lot of athletes would go to those uh meals and and i i even back then i said you know i think that's a mistake let's <laughs> temper that uh, volume of food that you're going <laughs> to take in and don't take in so many carbohydrates because you're going to feel like a, a, a balloon yep. on on race morning you end up retaining a lot of water and people are you know stiffness and their, their muscles aren't firing well and they just feel dreadful now, um, and fortunately with my association with, with EAS, uh, they're kind of evolutionary in getting one of the very first products out that really addresses this nutritional ketosis. So okay. uh, we're trying to burn fat-based bodies, ketone bodies. Right. And if an athlete is following this on a, for their nutritional regime, which they should, and there is very, very good science. This isn't, isn't something that just came up the last two years. No. Uh, really, in the in 1920s, they started treating epileptics um, with nutritional ketosis. Hmm. Very high, healthy fat. Healthy, healthy fat, and that's a key. Uh, moderate car uh, moderate uh, protein and right. very low carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate, you know, we're kind of looking at net carbs. So we're looking at healthy carbs. So you look, look at kale or spinach or sure. uh, broccoli, not a, a fluid replacement drink. 
right. and not a glass of cranberry juice that has no fiber. So uh, from a systemic health standpoint, aging standpoint, there's no inflammation on a nutritional ketogenic diet. Okay. EAS, sorry, it's long-winded. No, no. EAS is, has come up, come up with a keto powder that athletes can use that parallels this ketogenic diet. And you can use it as a recovery fluid. It, um, the base of it is very good uh, quality uh, fat and protein, egg and uh, coconut oil, okay. the, the, the main two. 75% of it is healthy fat. And we would never see this. We'd see 75% carbohydrate. Right. And the rest of it was you know, something else that they made up in some lab. So uh, it's a real uh, incredible shift in what we're trying to tell athletes and what people should be following just from a health standpoint. So people that are watching this race really should be on a ketogenic diet. And we're going to hear a lot more about it. So, you know, I, I feel with uh, association with uh, EAS, we're now telling the athletes to start making this shift. And by the way, we have this keto powder that really works. Love that. So when you look at this race yeah. in particular, we have a guy named Jan Ferdano, Olympic gold medalist, won here last year, third first time out, but is a, just what, 735 at, at Challenge Roth. That's wow. just ungodly, 239 marathon off the yeah. bike. Obviously, conditions here always play a significant factor, but someone like himself, someone like Sebastian Keenlay, do you, do you see the potential of somebody going sub eight hours here? Uh, I, I think absolutely, and I've said this for many, many years, the, the quality and the talent of the field, the depth of the field, yes. and, and the ability of Jan Ferdinand and Sebastian Kinley to run what they are in the 70.3 races. Yes. Just, just looking at the run, the run times are extraordinary. We've got guys running under 110 yes. off the bike, uh, wickedly fast. But it doesn't translate yet to the Kona Lava Fields, and even Jan Ferdano. You know, how can you fault the winner from last year? But I, but I look at it like he's the world champion. Right. He is a fast runner. He was falling apart as far as biomechanics last year on the run. He had a, a lead. But if someone ran 245, they would have caught him. They would have beat him. A, a yeah. decent time, but not a great time. I think Jan, Sebastian, uh, and there's several other that have the ability, as Craig Alexander did and never had his best day, even though he holds the record, right. running under 240 here, well under 240. And it's something that really, with when you look at everything else guys are doing, there's really no reason. There's no reason. I mean, Mark, well, Mark yeah. and I did that eons ago. Yes. Back in eight. Back Earth, in eighty nine. Earth was still cooling. When yeah, it was you still did that, cooling. Yeah. <laughs> it was still cooling. It's nice out here. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point, Bob. So yeah, you know, I'd love to see the men uh, shadow that two forty mark. Put together, obviously, a great swim and a bike, and then we're going to see a sub eight hour race here easily. And the women should be under two fifty. No question about it. Yeah. I mean, with the m women, with you've got uh, defending champion Danielle Reef. You got the three time champion Marina Carfer, who really didn't get a chance to race last year because right. she was injured. And then you've got Melissa Hallshoot who is a former steeplechaser and has never raced here either and has is pretty talented. So the women's race could be awesome as well. Yeah, the women are fast and on paper very, very fast. So uh, Marinda obviously has proven herself here, has run 252. And uh, 250. 250, excuse me, Bob, yes. and excuse me, Marinda, 250. So, you know, she's on the cusp of breaking that, and, and all of her competitors are aware that she's come back in a lot of races and gobbled up the, the, uh, the women's train right? Uh, because she's aggressive on that run, and she knows that she can run dis despite how she feels. She's able to pull that off. So, uh, you know, I'd love to see her run 247 and, and maybe Mel and uh, Daniela uh, close by. One of the things I look at is back in the day, you did this race. You did Ironman Kona. And you, I think you did Ironman in Japan, went 801, but really, you didn't do a lot of other Ironman races. No. And I think that is a factor in terms of these guys coming here, because I don't think people are necessarily here as fresh as they can be, because they've got a lot of racing, Ironman racing, in their legs. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult system now for the athletes to come here whole without right. some sort of niggling injury because they, they do have to get these qualifying the validation points. and the rest yeah, yeah, of it. And that, that word, that validation just <laughs> drives me crazy because we, we've got the world champions that have to validate their world championship. Sort of well, like if you win the Masters, you aren't validating. You, yeah, you're I, just, I, I just don't understand it. And, yeah. and I think, okay, are we exposing these world champions to another venue? But at the same time, we're jeopardizing the, their health so that they may not be at full capacity here. And, and really, we want all the best champions to be in their top form come October in, in Kailua Kona. That's going to have the best race. So I, I think they really need to modify the qualifying system. I don't know how. 
Um, I, uh, the, certainly the champions don't need to validate their world championship. That's nonsense to me. I agree. And, uh, and I would just like to, to see a system where if they've proven themselves over the last three years that they ha there's some sort of carte blanche where, where they're able to get that slot or retain that slot. Or, and again, it, yeah. it, it needs a lot of scrutiny. And again, I can be pretty flippant in my comments on how do we do this. I don't know. But I just want the athletes whole when they get here. My feeling is, and, and my, my point would be, some athletes like a Chrissy Wellington might prefer to do a full to quote unquote validate, yeah. but other athletes might prefer to do two 70.3 races. So Ironman would be getting two appearances from an athlete and an athlete would do uh, two 70.3 races, which I don't think is out of line yeah. and gets them, keeps them sharp, keeps them ready to go. Because yeah. I look at someone like a Craig Alexander, I think he could have had two more great races here. But I think if you look at winning 70.3 in mm. 2011, four weeks later winning Kona setting course record, six months later, winning Melbourne and running 237 off the bike, right. being forced to run that, and basically three world-class performances in six months, I don't think it's realistic to stay, to maintain a career when yeah. you're trying to do that. Well, you, you see the peak races, and certainly in running, they all fall within a window. So when an athlete is on, it's usually about an eight to 12 week span where you can right. kind of hold that upper end, that peak. And it obviously depends on the distance. You rarely see a marathoner repeat a marathon during that window. It's one marathon. Yes. So, you know, the athletes here that are running fast are getting beaten up pretty badly. And that's the top women and the top yes. men. The 14 hour athletes, it's a long day. It's an arduous day, but they're not getting the eccentric load that, that the top and athletes are on the run. They're not going to have the residual uh, fatigue yes. and wear and tear that the top pros are. Other innovations that you've been involved with, you're working with, uh, you're working with Hoka, Ona Ona. And what's great about that product, I call it the official shoe of double ARP. There's a lot of us <laughs> older guys who, who can't, you know, who need, who want to run, yeah. but because of all the racing and age, really can't run as much anymore. And I have found these shoes have been amazing. Yeah. That allows myself and others to be able to run more than we were running 10 years ago. Yeah, well I think the, the maybe the misnomer on that and what you just said is that they do provide cushioning but you sit low in that shoe contrary to the look of them where you have right. a very high profile. I have mine on right now of course. Uh, and the other third part is that they're very responsive. So you limit that stance phase for older lads yes. like ourselves. Yes, so yes, we have yes. that quick rebound or recoil. So we look like a 25-year-old deer. At least in our in our minds. Well, in our minds. But they actually have that feel, <laughs> feel as well. So they're not just for the uh, AARP. Uh, they're for the everybody. Yeah, yeah. They're for everybody. And, and we're seeing the elites wear them, which is a good testament that these work for the very best runners and also track runners as well. Yeah. Technologically, the, the uh, Hoka team is uh, absolutely paramount to, to the number one in the industry. They have the leaders as far as the technical uh, intuition and insight and investigation in developing their shoes. So they were funny looking when they first came out. Yes. And now they're pretty cool. So are you, I, I know you're still training on a daily basis, substantial. How many hours do you put in a day just, just doing, just training? Well, I don't put a lot of hours in, Bob. I, uh, I, when I tr train now, I just try to get in a little higher quality and, okay. uh, just oh. because of time limitation. And so uh, and I actually gave a talk at the medical conference about the issues of overtraining mm. and, and a lot of athletes that have heart issues. And I had one a, a year yes. ago. Uh, so, you know, probably a good thing my schedule so darn crammed, but I try to squeeze in what I can. I did have a shoot uh, this morning down at the pier, and we've got the backdrop here yes. of the um, course. And so I, once I got out there, I said, you know what, I think I'm only on at 9 o'clock, but it was 9.30. So I decided to swim the course this morning, so that was quite nice. <laughs> um, you also have a Dave Scott coffee. Mm. Yes! <laughs> What the heck? <laughs> I don't know, Bob, because I didn't drink coffee when I was racing. And, and now I, I in, in moderation, like everything I do, haha, a very type A, I have about a liter a day. Uh, but we, I have a premium uh, coffee at uh, Kona, Kona Coffee and Tea up on Polani. Yes. So all the athletes will see it coming down and running back up. And we've got a great alliance. They have a, a premium grade. It's grown up high on the slopes here between yep. 2,000 plus to 3,400 feet. And, uh, you know, feel really fortunate to have a coffee. Kind of a cool thing. It's, uh, you know, a great alliance to have EAS and Hoka, the vertical companies. But now I have a coffee bean, 
and it's up there right now. And we're going to be up there doing a Facebook Live yeah, on, on Saturday on, on race Saturday. Day. That's right. Yeah. So. Uh, for those of you that are in the audience and you're here, just uh, come on by. Uh, we also have some 8-ounce uh, and 16-ounce bags if people want to purchase them. And, and I have a couple around the corner that are 50-pound bags, Bob. So 50-pound bags? Yeah, no, just a, just a, sort of half. Yeah, a, yes. a two-week um, store of it. So uh, when you look back at the first time you and I went to Oahu, 1980, yeah. and we're talking a long time ago, 36 <laughs> years. Can you believe that you're still involved with this <laughs> silly sport? 36, 36 years, years later. Wow, that, Isn't that, that amazing? That, that is shocking. It Bob. really is. Yeah, and you had that uh, really good looking balloon tire. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. had that furry beard, and it looked like a caveman. You were I really thought. worried about me at the start, I'm sure. A little bit. I said, wow, who's that guy over there, that cave dweller? He looks uh, <laughs> pretty intimidated as an athlete. <laughs> Uh, not that worried. Actually, I wasn't really. Uh, I think we were all kind of worried just about can we get through this day, even yes. though I. You not, knew. I, I knew. I, I, I wanted to race the thing. Yes. And, you know, ironically, I got out of the water, didn't see anyone the rest of the day. Right. So it was kind of just a long time trial. But, um, yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's a distant memory, but it's still a vivid one. But, but what's fascinating, the year before, there was 15 people. Our year, there was 108. And now there's, I think, 95 70.3 races around the world, wow. 45 full Ironmans. Mm. You know, company sold for nine hundred million dollars. Our sport is obviously has been validated. Mm -hmm. Does it surprise you? Because this was something I think both of us at different levels. You swam, rode, and ran. That's you know, and you were working working as a swim instructor. This was sort of what you were doing, and then it became a sport. And then it became an Olympic sport. And then it became mm -hmm. a multi-million dollar company. Does it surprise you where it's come? Uh, I think when you uh, bring it in those terms, and I didn't really know the final term, 900 million. Yeah. I wish I could go back to those six Ironman wins. And say, can I have a percentage? Yeah, what was I your just, first paycheck, 86? Uh, the, yeah, the first four wins were a T-shirt. And a bagel. And, I think yeah. we tossed no, it I got a bagel. a bagel or a rice cake, something that's really nutrition, <laughs> nutritionally dense like this yes. table. Uh, yeah, it was kind of nominal. Like, hey, you won the race. Great to have you out here. Could you come back again next year? So, I, you know, I said, well, it's kind of fun. I'll pay for all my expenses, do it again, and win another T-shirt. Uh, so I did that the first four years. In 86, an Islander put up the money. So I won 8000 in 86 and 10000 Same guy in 87. I think he humiliated the Ironman Corporation at the time, and they finally put up money after that. But, uh, you know, the growth of the sport is staggering. And I think just seeing the, the worldwide participation yeah. that we have now is really phenomenal. Um, you know, going to the venues uh, for Ironman while I'm here and just hearing, you know, athletes, uh, uh, Russian athletes as I came in today and, of course, Singapore, Malaysia. Yes. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it is really awesome for the sport and the growth of it has just been staggering. Love it. Dave, as always, always enjoy chatting with you. Thanks so much for taking so much time. Tonight, mm. we'll be at Four Seasons. Yes, we will. That'll be a fun evening. And, It'll really well. uh, We've got a nice dinner planned and a little more chit-chat. So I thank you, Bob, it. for having me on your show. How about a round of applause for Mr. Dave Scott? Poncho Man, take us out. Breakfast with Bob and Brother Dave. Ha, 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 ha.